Um, I've written books about each of the two uh, characters who are at the center of the competition today, so I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about these two and their relationship. Um, uh, a number of other authors have also written about different aspects of it. Uh, in fact, there's a recent book by a guy named James Simon with a provocative title, Eisenhower versus Warren. Uh, that strikes me, I don't know, Simon. Um, uh, and I like the book. Uh, the title strikes me as maybe a little uh, more provocative uh, than is necessary. I don't think it's really correct to think of them as opponents, um, certainly just factually, as the case that Eisenhower put Warren on the court. And so it's not quite right, I think, to think of them as antagonists. Um, uh, but it is true, I think it's right to say, and the title gets it bad, that their interaction, the long uh, relationship uh, in politics, uh, covering the entire Eisenhower administration and beyond, um, is uh, laced with uh, moments of misunderstanding, uh, disagreement. Uh, I, would, I would characterize it less as a conflict between them than as a divergence in their uh, attempts to grapple with issues. Very different styles, very different, uh, more different than appear on the surface of politics. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Generally united in their goals. Uh, I would say, generally speaking, on the big issues of the day, you wouldn't have found them directly opposed on the objective uh, that each was trying to achieve, but you certainly would have found differences between them, and we'll talk about some of them uh, and how to get to those. Um, so uh, let me just give a little background then. Um, Initially, Warren and uh, Eisenhower did not have a relationship that, that went back into their young lives. They, they met each other in politics at the, after the conclusion uh, of the Second World War. Uh, as they were both engaged in politics, Warren had been involved in politics for a long time. Of course, Warren was a very successful politician in California. I'll talk about it a little more in just a second. But, um, but in the moment that their paths really crossed, they appeared to many people, including each other, to be very similar uh, in terms of their politics. Both were moderate internationalist Republicans. Um, both were sympathetic to social issues uh, of the day, uh, progressive social issues. Both were fairly conservative on economic issues. Um, both of them, and this is important, saw their uh, greatest antagonists, their biggest critics, as people to their right. Uh, so while they were both Republicans, in the case of Eisenhower, uh, Robert Taft, and other uh, isolationist Republicans, the other ones, he would have identified as the people he was most opposed to of the political spectrum. Uh, similarly, uh, Warren was not did not have the internationalist uh, background uh, that I did. Nobody really did. Um, uh, so uh, Warren was more engaged in domestic political agenda, particularly in California. But again, if you had if you looked at Warren's fiercest critics uh, during his governorship, they tended to come from his right. The biggest fight he had as governor of California um, was with the American Medical Association, which opposed his uh, attempt to create a uh, single-payer system uh, for healthcare in California, came within one vote of passing. It's interesting to imagine how different history might have been uh, had that passed. Uh, in fact, it's the program that, um, that uh, Trump uh, tried to emulate as president. Um, so again, in terms of thinking of them in terms of the political spectrum, both moderate Republicans, but both most conscious of criticism from their right. And, and that, oh, they had all that in common. Um, Warren, uh, while not known for his international views on international issues, he would have uh, allied with you know, Eisenhower to the degree that he had really thought them out. And similarly, Eisenhower on most issues domestically with Warren. Um, now, uh, I say it appeared that way because there are, uh, what that kind of sort of surface gloss uh, disguises or fails to eliminate is a very important difference in their politics that most people at the time didn't recognize. And, uh, and that's that Warren comes out of a, a, a progressive Republican tradition in California. Um, and the, progressives, the, prog the progressive Republicans uh, were a force in politics in a lot of parts of the country. Uh, California, Wisconsin were both big uh, locuses of, the, of that movement. Um, but it really bent politics differently in California in a way that I think, for instance, Eisenhower really did not completely comprehend when he felt uh, akin or a kinship with Warren. Uh, Warren came of age in, in early 20th century California, he's the last governor, the last chief justice, and the last California governor born in the 19th century. Um, so he grew up in early 20th century California. That's really the height of the progressive movement in California. Um, Hyder Johnson, who was the governor of California in the 1910s, um, 
is the person who was ran as a progressive Republican, was elected, and brought with him the progressive reforms that in fact continue to shape California politics for better and sometimes for worse uh, today. Things like the referendum and the recall, Governor Gavin Newsom, our governor of California, uh, is today facing a recall. It's, that's a whole other conversation which I won't worry with. But, um, but uh, the reason that he's facing a recall is that it's pursuant to the laws that were enacted in 1911 uh, as part of the progressive reforms. Warren was very much influenced by this. And the progressives, again, because they don't really exist in our politics today, it's kind of hard to recreate uh, their place. Uh, in broad strokes, I would just say they, are, they sort of sit between kind of labor Democrats and business Republicans. It was a, it's not really the same um, as a populist movement. Uh, populist politics, which we associate with Huey Long and others, uh, had their own kind of flavor, and there's a little bit of overlap between the progressives and the populists. But really, the, the progressives, at least in California, were small business people, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, who were equally uh, felt shut out by big business and equal and threatened by labor. Uh, so they found themselves in this uh, kind of bourgeois, uh, small business owner, farmers, uh, others, made up the progressives in California. And importantly, they saw as among their enemies, critics, opponents, big business, and specifically in California, the Southern Pacific Railroad. Um, so when Eisenhower, who very much naturally affiliated with business interests, imagined that he had a kinsman in Warren, he did not, I think, fully comprehend that he was dealing with a progressive Republican who came out of a different political tradition than Eisenhower himself was part of. So there were, while there were surface similarities and some real similarities in their politics, there was this important distinction that I think at the time, if when you see, when you read the coverage, for instance, of Warren being appointed to the court, very little discussion of that. And yet it was incredibly important to Warren. Warren had only one portrait that hung in his office of governor, and it was Hiram Johnson, someone who was really meaningful to him. Um, again, I think sort of invisible to Eisenhower. Um, as I said, they did not know each other going way back, but they met in the course of their political lives. They ran against each other in 1952 for the Republican nomination. Um, they fought it all the way to the convention. Um, there is a popular, but I think a misconception, um, that uh, Eisenhower, when Warren withdrew, that Eisenhower promised him the Chief Justiceship in, in return for his withdrawal. There's really not evidence of that, and, and it's, it's undermined by the fact that Warren never really did withdrew, withdraw. He only uh, dropped out once he really lost. Uh, Warren, in fact, blamed his defeat in part on Nixon, who was a member of the California delegation and whom Warren hated. Um, and so he was tempted to blame him for a lot of things, but in this case, there's some good reason for it. Nixon was so eager to curry favor with Eisenhower that he offered to help Eisenhower defeat Warren in California. Um, but once the convention ended, uh, ended rather, uh, Warren uh, enthusiastically uh, endorsed Eisenhower, helped him win in California, strategized California. Um, and at the conclusion of the campaign, Warren, uh, rather, Eisenhower promised Warren what he said the first vacancy on the Supreme Court. He had offered him incidentally a cabinet position. Warren turned it down, um, probably because he couldn't afford it. Uh, Warren had young kids for college, uh, for the pay cut. So we in California and also didn't get a house in a while so, uh, to, get, to take a cabinet job. Uh, so the, the first vacancy uh, was on the table. Warren believed he had uh, an open invitation to take it. Um, it came, what came up uh, was unexpected. Uh, the first vacancy that occurred uh, after uh, Eisenhower was uh, sworn in as president was the Chief Justiceship. <clears throat> Neither uh, Warren nor Eisenhower expected that that would be the first vacancy. That because Wilson, <coughs> who was then the Chief Justice, overweight, lifelong smoker, uh, died suddenly of a heart attack in September of 1953. Um, in one sense, uh, I, I would say this to, to Vincent or his heirs, but in some sense that's sort of historically fortuitous uh, that he died uh, when he did. Um, the Supreme Court had been stuck over the most important issue that was before it at that point, uh, which was the Brown uh, case, the school desegregation case. Uh, under Vincent's leadership, it seemed clear that at best the court would be divided on it. It's even possible, depending on how you sort of suss up the votes, that the Vincent court would have voted to uphold school segregation. Um, instead, uh, it, they were, were deadlocked at the time of his death. Felix Frankfurter, uh, fellow justice, a very tart, uh, sort of sharply, uh, uh, sharply witted Chief Justice remarked that Vincent's death was the first solid evidence he'd ever received of the existence of God. Um, <laughs> so uh, so um, Eisenhower had promised Warren the vacancy. Warren saw the vacancy and assumed it was his for the taking. 
Uh, in fact, Eisenhower did not immediately deliver on that promise. He did not believe that he had made a promise for the chief justiceship. He thought about promoting one of the other justices. Uh, not terribly, when you look at the rest of the justices, the period, all of them had been appointed by either FDR or Truman. Um, so there wasn't a justice who jumped out uh, to Eisenhower as a natural chief. Um, he offered uh, the chief justice, or at least sort of casually offered it, uh, to uh, Dulles, uh, who was the Secretary of State. That's a, a sort of nightmarish, counterfactual, historical possibility that Dulles had taken it. But Dulles turned it down. Uh, Dulles wanted the, the uh, Secretary of State job, uh, wanted to stay in it, rather. Um, and so having sort of gently sounded out uh, Dulles on it, Eisenhower then, in fact, delivered the first vacancy of Warren. Uh, Warren took the, uh, accepted the uh, appointment, uh, served out the, uh, his final week of uh, the California governorship uh, on a Friday. He left California on a Friday. He started as Chief Justice the following Monday morning. Um, he actually served without uh, confirmation by the United States Senate from the fall of 1953 until the spring of 1954. It's a fairly inconceivable uh, idea these days as a recess appointment. Um, and when it came time for his confirmation hearings, he was invited to appear as, as nominees are. And he refused to appear. He argued that because he was the sitting chief justice at that point, they would violate the separation of powers for him to appear, which is complete horseshit. Uh, but it was, it was a, a nifty excuse for him to avoid to actually having to appear. He was, there was a little bit of a battle around his confirmation uh, by uh, Bill Langer, um, a sort of outrageous senator of the period. It ultimately was confirmed on a voice vote, so there, uh, he was easily confirmed. Um, <clears throat> the, before I get into the court and where their divisions really started to, to uh, emerge, let me just note that um, judicial appointments are different for presidents than any other kind of appointment they make. The, the vast majority of people the presidents bring into office, they bring into the executive branch, uh, cabinet members, department heads, uh, lawyers, advisors. What all those people have in common is uh, that they serve at the president's behest, the president can fire them at any time, um, and they serve to advise the president on policy matters, and then once those policy matters are decided, to carry them out. Um, they are employees of the president. Judicial appointments in all those respects are different. Um, they're lifetime appointments. <clears throat> they report to they're part of a different branch of government. The president has no power to remove them. Um, and they really are, for all practical purposes, immune from being removed, except for uh, acts of you know, illegal acts or acts of, uh, that would warrant impeachment. Um, so a president who appoints a judicial nominee is in the often uncomfortable position of tapping someone who he or she believes will be the right person, will carry out a certain vision, but having no control over that vision once, once the nomination is, is approved, assuming that it's approved. That certainly turned out to be the case with Warren. And, and Warren is by, by no means the only justice who has confounded the president uh, who appointed him. So while this story uh, has particular, particular large consequences, I think, for the country, there are many other examples of presidents who have nominees who then go in a direction that they were not expecting them to go. Um, so, in the case of Warren and Eisenhower, the, the misunderstandings between them began quite early. Um, Brown was, uh, the Brown case, <clears throat> as I mentioned, was pending before the court when Warren arrived uh, in 53. Uh, while the case was, was still being heard and considered by the Supreme Court, Eisenhower invited Warren to join him for a stag dinner at the White House. Eisenhower had regular stag dinners in those days. Um, seated within earshot of the Chief Justice at the dinner was John Davies, who was the lawyer for South Carolina. Um, it, it pretty much goes without saying, with all due respect uh, to, to Thurgood Marshall, Thurgood Marshall was not among those, uh, who was the lawyer for the other side, was not among those who was invited to the dinner that night. And Warren was appalled. Uh, that he considered a real breach of decorum, uh, that he would be in the company of the, of the lawyer for one side of the case, especially without the lawyer for the other side of the president. That's made all the worse by the fact that as there's a break in the dinner, and Eisenhower goes to lead his guests into the next room for cigars and brandy or whatever, and he, holding the Chief Justice by the arm, gestures to the Southerners in the room and says, these are not bad people. They just don't want their little girl sitting next to some big, overgrown Negro. Uh, there is no excuse uh, for that remark. Uh, it is variously reported with even more colorful uh, and objectionable language. Um, uh, Warren, the reason we know about this remark is that Warren recorded it in his memoirs, which shows you how pissed off he was uh, about it. Um, uh, 
at best, one can say that that is crude and insensitive. At worst, it feels like you know, uh, elbow twisting the, the Chief Justice of the United States. Uh, and Warren was furious about it. And uh, by, we know by the fact that he included in his memoirs uh, that he never got over it. So that's early. Uh, that's in 50, early 54. Uh, Brown was announced, the Brown decision was announced on May 17th of that year. Um, many observers greeted it as a thunderclap uh, in the history of civil rights. Some people regard it as the most important decision uh, in the history of the United States Supreme Court. Um, Eisenhower, as those of you who were there last night know, um, or may know otherwise, uh, Eisenhower was not as impressed uh, as some people were with the ruling. He waited for two days to comment about it, and when he finally did comment on it, the substance of his comment was to say that the court has spoken and I will obey. Uh, there was nothing about the triumph of it or the importance of it in American history. Uh, he, he seemed to regard it grudgingly. Um, and that is very much the tone by which he pursued civil rights for much of his administration. And Warren got yeah, presented it. Um, stepping away from their relationship just for a moment, well, that's uh, exasperating to Warren for sure. Um, it's all the greater influence, the greater sin of Eisenhower's sort of tepid response to Brown is that it encouraged those who wanted to resist Brown to think that he might be alive with them. Um, now, whether he was or not, I'll we'll get to that in just a second, but uh, the, that, that perception of ambivalence uh, did give uh, comfort and encouragement to those who would resist because they thought it was possible that Eisenhower would at least do nothing, if not actively support resistance. Um, and you know, those, form, those forces of resistance were formidable, as people like to say. Brown, Brown too, decided the following year, ordered states to proceed with desegregation, as it said, unfortunately, with all deliberate speed, was the language, which resulted, as many have remarked, with a lot of deliberation and not very much speed. Um, there are some states, Virginia included, that shut down their entire school systems uh, rather than desegregate. Um, so the, it is, there is no overstating degree of resistance that was out there, and any uh, latitude that Eisenhower gave to those forces of resistance was, again, at best unfortunate and at worst shameful. Um, uh, it, um, and, and now back to their relationship, it also was personally very frustrating to Warren, who believed that the court had made a clear, unanimous constitutional ruling. Uh, there is, we don't have provisions under the Constitution for a constitutional right that you can, we will allow you to enjoy someday in the future. When the court declares that there is a constitutional right, the presumption is you are entitled to enjoy that right now. Um, and so Eisenhower's patience with the resistance, Warren found not only destructive to the country, but also undermining of the court, uh, what it was trying to do. Um, so that became a further source of division between the president and the chief justice. Um, it's also clear, and I'm going to apologize for those of you who heard me say this last night, but it's also important to note that when that when resistance to desegregation reached its real apex, which is in the Little Rock School crisis in 1957, Eisenhower did, in fact, respond with force. Um, again, he tried to find a kind of way through that crisis, uh, but failing to do so, uh, once he realized that Governor Faubus in Arkansas was not going to do what he said he would do, uh, which is uh, escort the children's children into school. Eisenhower, the son of the first airborne, under the first airborne, did what Faubus would not do, which is help those children go to school. Um, and so uh, whatever misgivings Eisenhower might have had about the court taking the lead on this or about the, the content of Brown versus Board, uh, at least when federal power was threatened by it, he rose to the occasion. Um, so while there are differences between them, there are also points of common interest and of support for whatever reason. Um, uh, it is often assumed when people talk about the differences between Ike and Warren or, or the conflict between them that the, because the center of so much of the Warren court's attention was civil rights, that those differences were principally over civil rights. In fact, there is a whole other body of cases uh, that in some ways probably was a source of more antagonism. Um, these would fall under the general category of civil liberties as opposed to civil rights. Uh, those uh, involved basically the aftermath of McCarthy and the, the uh, anti-communist efforts by McCarthy and others in the early the to mid 1950s. Uh, a lot of those cases came to the Supreme Court. And they came in a lot of different guises. Uh, because not only was McCarthy and, and well, McCarthy and Congress trying to root out communist aversion, but you had state governments and state legislatures and state attorney generals and local governments. So these cases came in all these slight different formulations where you would have 
you know, the Attorney General of New Hampshire would have compiled a subversive list, and someone would be on that list and challenge it, and it would come to the court, or that the legislature in Illinois or a different state would, would have some kind of anti-subversion effort, and the people who were swept up in that uh, effort would bring their cases to the court. One big set of cases came out of California, in fact. Um, the court, not always, but almost always, sided with those uh, who, were, who were targeted in those cases, um, and did so on a, a variety of legal bases, which are probably too dense to, to try to enumerate here. But in some cases, people asserted a Fifth Amendment right against self-determination, and the court generally would uphold their right to assert the Fifth Amendment. In some other cases, they asserted a First Amendment right to affiliate with people. Keeping in mind the Communist Party throughout this period was not illegal in the United States. So the, so the question of how to pro how or whether to prosecute or punish people for membership in a legal organization was complicated uh, as a legal matter. And generally speaking, the court sided with those people who were targeted. Uh, it, it, this infuriated Eisenhower, who himself was, I should say, some conflicted about these. He thought McCarthy was deplorable. Um, did everything he could, though some of you may have tuned into Dave Nichols' uh, talk online the other day about this it was part of this event. Uh, Dave has written a whole book about Ike and McCarthy and shown quite convincingly, at least in my mind, the effort, how successful Eisenhower ultimately was in undermining McCarthy. At the same time, Eisenhower really did believe that communist subversion in the, in the federal bureaucracy, particularly the State Department, um, was a real threat. Uh, and so uh, he, uh, while doing his best to cut off McCarthy, also resented the court undermining what he thought were appropriate efforts to get at the subversion. Um, uh, again, I, I quoted this last night, so pardon me for repeating myself, but there came a point in retirement where, both, uh, where Eisenhower was in his post-presidency and Warren was retired. Warren asked him, he, Warren said, I hear you're, you're angry about the way we handled these communist cases. What, what, what should we have done differently? What would you have done? And Eisenhower's response was, I would kill the SOBs. <laughs> uh, are you, Warren put this in his memoir, too. He described this in his, in his memoir as uh, merely petulant rather than definitive. <laughs> pretty snotty. But uh, in any case, uh, there too was a source of ongoing disagreement and conflict between them. Um, a couple of very last things. Um, many of you probably are familiar with a quote that's often attributed to Eisenhower. He was asked, uh, reportedly asked, you know, what mistakes he made as president. And he's often quoted as saying, the biggest damn fool mistake I made was appointing Earl Warren. Um, Sometimes the quote is the two biggest damn fool mistakes I ever made were appointing Earl Warren and William Brennan. Uh, the fact that it shows up both ways is cause for suspicion. Um, I, I must say, I'm, I am uh, dubious uh, about whether he actually said it or actually meant it. He, he wrote memoirs himself, it's not his memoirs. Um, it, um, it doesn't sound to me, it doesn't sound like him. Uh, it doesn't sound like him to admit a failing of that uh, magnitude for one thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, I also, I, while it's certainly possible that in a moment of anger, he had a temper, um, it's certainly possible in a moment of anger that he may have popped off about Warren or Brian. Um, uh, and, and by the way, I should say, with Warren, some reason to understand why he might have misunderstood Warren's background in California progressive politics, there's absolutely no reason for, for Eisenhower to have been surprised by William Brennan, though. Uh, Eisenhower appointed William Brennan in 56, he was running for re-election. He asked for Brunel as attorney general to find him out moderate Catholic Democrat from the Northeast with judicial experience, because that's the one hole in Eisenhower's political uh, map at that point. Um, he got, I would say he got like three out of four. He got a Catholic with judicial experience from the Northeast, but he was not a moderate. Uh, Brennan was a, was a liberal judge, and he was a liberal justice, and Eisenhower has absolutely no reason to pretend to be uh, surprised by what he got from Brennan. Um, in any case, uh, did he regard Warren as the worst mistake of his presidency? Uh, it, it seems unlikely to me that that's, that that's a genuine expression of his overall appraisal of Warren. Um, uh, it's also important to note that that quote comes to us originally um, uh, from uh, uh, Stephen Ambrose, who was one of, one of the early biographers of uh, Eisenhower. In the years since Ambrose's book come out, came out, we've learned a lot about the fabrications uh, that Ambrose put into that book. Uh, yeah, there's a lot. That's we'll talk about that in a minute if you'd like. But, um, there's reason to distrust uh, Ambrose's quotes of Eisenhower. Uh, 
uh, I would put this in the category of something that could be apocryphal, could be untrue, could be true, but if true sounds, to use Warren's words, rather more petulant than definitive. Uh, there's a lot that, that I mean, we've, I've talked about two areas of cases, civil liberties and civil rights, where there were differences, but th those represent a fairly small fraction of the overall work of the court uh, in that period. And it's a little hard for me to believe that Eisenhower believed Warren was such a grave mistake across all fields. Um, the last thing I'll say on this, um, you know, I, because I've written books on each of these men, uh, I've been, they ran against each other in 52. I've certainly given a lot of thought to the question of what if Warren had won? Uh, what if Warren had won in 52? How would history have been different? Um, I think it is correct to believe, and this is all hypothetical, of course, but that the country's course through civil rights would have been smoother. Uh, that Warren clearly had a, a, a more uh, finely tuned sense of the moral urgency of civil rights than Eisenhower did. Uh, and I think he would have led the country more successfully through that period. I also think it's possible that we would have had a nuclear war uh, in that period, uh, because Eisenhower, and really Eisenhower alone, I think had the fortitude and gravity and the understanding of alliances and of his military colleagues to resist uh, repeated calls to resort to nuclear weapons. And, and sadly, and I say this in no way to diminish the importance of civil rights, but even civil rights are insignificant if you're dead. Um, and so uh, the, I do think it's, uh, in some ways, we are lucky that they ended up in the positions they had. Uh, the other fact, of course, is that if Warren had won the presidency, Eisenhower would not have gone to the court, would not have been in a position to sustain that. There's no place for him there. So the only way to get them both uh, was for Mike Dewan and Warren to go to the court. Uh, and then the last thing I would say about that is that Warren went to the court and he was there for 16 years. Um, and uh, the arc of civil rights and of criminal justice and civil liberties, the cases that really define the Warren court, uh, the nature of the court is it's very hard for the court to resolve issues in a single term because they tend to come up uh, repeatedly and in different guises. And having Warren there for that whole period might have actually better suited his capacity and his abilities than a, than a shorter run as president. So. So in some sense, I think that uh, we are lucky and perhaps alive uh, because of the way uh, the, the, the that election turned out. So anyway, that's a short summation of a long relationship between two important men. But uh, as I said, I'm really most interested in talking to you all about it. So we've got some time. Let's start. Now. We have about 20 minutes. Anybody have any questions? think Warren felt it so important that the Brown decision be 9-0? Excellent. Yeah, I'm glad you asked because I probably should have mentioned that. Um, first of all, I think it's almost one of, it may be Warren's greatest contribution to American history that he delivered in an unanimous court in that. Um, I, I mentioned in passing earlier, uh, it's a little hard to know how the court would have come, it's always hard to know how the court would have gotten until the court actually concludes its work. Um, but if you read the notes, the justices who kept notes on the deliberations before Warren got there, it's clear that there were at least three votes to uphold segregation. Reed, I'm going to get the names right now, but it was Reed, Clark, uh, Reed, Reed, Clark, and who's the third? Who's the third? Uh, and then two, there's two wobblers, uh, Jackson and Frankfurter, because Jackson and Frankfurter were very uncomfortable with segregation, but also uncomfortable with the so-called activism that would require the court to overturn Plessy. Um, I'm going to get that outline of that third justice now, but it'll come back to me in a minute. Um, in any case, there were at least three votes. And, oh, Vincent himself, I'm sorry, was the third. Um, so there were, at best, I think the best of the proponents of desegregation could have hoped for in the Vincent court was a six to three ruling with the chief justice in dissent uh, striking school segregation. That's hardly the convincing moral victory that Warren was looking for. For one thing, it meant that Southern justices would have voted differently from the Northern justices, with one exception, Hugo Black. He's a different story. But, um, uh, so, a divided court, in Warren's view, would have, uh, a divided court that struck segregation would have achieved the legal result that he thought appropriate, but it would have denied the country the unambiguous moral uh, statement of the profound rejection of segregation. And it, it meant, it was, this, Warren recognized that it was especially important that they, there be a geographic diversity in that, and that the Southern justices join. 
Um, so he worked very hard uh, to get that unanimous court. Um, it's great behind the scenes stuff that we can, we can that I try to recreate uh, in the book. The last justice to come on board uh, was Stanley Reed. Stanley Reed was uh, segregationist. So Stanley Reed, just a few years prior to Brown, had refused to attend a court Christmas party at Black Pages were invited because he wouldn't want to attend a desegregated party. And then he voted to desegregate it Brown. Um, it is Warren's work as a political leader, really, that made that happen. Um, there is one sort of important concession in all of that that was that gave a lot of ground, and historians argue about whether it was too much ground to have given, and that is this language of desegregation with all deliberate speed. The court you know, could easily have said that schools must desegregate tomorrow. It's a con constitutional violation. Every student's entitled to go to their neighborhood school. End of story. The court's big fear in that period, maybe appropriate, maybe not, um, was that they would issue order and people would just reject it. And they would just refuse to obey it. And then the court as an institution would be so diminished that it would have lost its authority. And as it turned out, even with the language of all deliberate speed, there was profound resistance and it went on for years. So there is some reason to believe that that assessment was correct. Um, Warren believed that the it was so important to deliver a unanimous court that he was willing to delay the, the imposition of the remedy. Um, and they even split it into two cases. So they decided the constitutional question and came back a year later with the remedy. Um, I, you know, it's, it, there's no, no way to answer whether that was the right thing to do, but it is, uh, it is a way of underscoring how important we thought that unanimity was. Uh, and I do, I do think that, that the, other, the other thing, of course, about the unanimity is it carried over into all the later segregations. So when cases came back about segregated golf courses or swimming pools or other institutions, the court unanimously, time and time again, would reject the segregation claim and base it solely on Brown. Uh, which, you know, I'll we'll say one last thing there. That's a little flimsy when you think about the legal reasoning of it, because Brown, the Brown case is decided on the particulars of education and the effects that segregation had on children. It's not really clear why there's same effects would carry over into golf courses or pools. So the legal reasoning is a little shaky. Um, but the, the moral position, the political position, is stated over and over again, and stated unanimously over and over again. OK, any other questions? Yes. You've talked about this all deliberate speed um, thing. Are there historically other Supreme Court decisions that have dragged on so long and so um, with so much friction as as that one. Are there precedents for for basically people to choose to ignore or try to weasel their way around a decision? Well, I guess I'm tempted to point to Roe versus Wade, um, okay. where uh, they, the resistance to Roe takes a different form. Um, uh, you know, uh, Roper's Wade, by the way, not a Warren Court case. People often assume that it was. The, uh, the case upon which it is predicated, the case known as Griswold, uh, is a Warren Court decision. And that's the first case. Not It's one of the first cases to uh, amplify and recognize a, a right of privacy in the Constitution. And Roe depends on that reasoning. Uh, Griswold is a contraception case out of Connecticut. But, um, uh, but I would say some of the resistance to Roe has some of the same flavor in the sense of uh, states pecking at it, trying to find ways to uh, avoid the constitutional certainty of it. The authors of Roe, in some ways, kind of ask for that. The, the trimester approach, based on viability, is is a difficult. First of all, there's nothing very constitutional about that analysis. Um, it's biological fundamentally, um, and the problem with that, of course, is it changes. Um, and as as assessments of viability change, it's unclear how the Constitution should absorb those under Roe. I think most people would say that Roe would probably be on firmer political terrain if Congress had reached the same conclusion. The problem is Congress wasn't going to. So that's, and that, by the same with segregation, one of the reasons, we yeah. probably would have probably been easier force for desegregation if these states had been willing to do it on their own, but they weren't, and that was the problem. So, uh, so the resistance to Roe, I think, is different than Brown, um, but it's, there's some of the same flavor to it. And you know, people, People are stubborn and they're inventive, uh, and, uh, and the court the court has to decide cases that are presented to them. It doesn't have the luxury of going out and legislating a solution, and so it's 
it's sometimes in that position of kind of fighting a rear guard, actually. Some people, um, just a little bit of an aside, but uh, Brennan, who I've mentioned a couple times here, very important justice in the Warren Court, but it, some people regard his greatest contribution to the legacy of the Warren Court as his rear guard action that he fought in the years of the Burger Court, which followed Warren of continuing to protect a number of Warren Court legacies from those kinds of uh, actions. And some more successful than others, cases like Miranda, uh, with the right to counsel cases, all of those had, had some resistance and nibbling away at their efficacy. Brennan, as long as he was there, was very effective at kind of checking those. Of course, he's still getting that, too. Do you have a question over here? Okay, right. Yeah, so looking at the next president after Eisenhower, you know, JFK, um, I guess we watched Selma last year, which is I really recommended. I, I thought it was good, good in this. But it seemed that painted, and I've heard it said that the best thing JFK ever did for civil rights was to, you know, sound harsh, but to die, mm -hmm. because you know Johnson did did quite a bit in, in almost following the lead of the, the Little Rock, you know, inter military intervention. Um, am I right in thinking, well, in googling <laughs> that in 1961 inaugural Around the time of his inauguration, JFK said uh, segregation uh, now and segregation. You know, he he was he's kind of you know pandering to the segregationists in his, you know, among his support. But only three short two and a half years later, you know, he was going to bring in troops um, in, in a similar situation. Can you, do you have much? Well, it's Kennedy who brought troops on behalf of James Meredith. Um, so Kennedy, I don't. I think maybe you're being a little more harsh with Kennedy than, than than he deserves. But I also think you're absolutely right that in the end, it's Johnson who really do, who really delivers the big legislative victories, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. Uh, I mean, John. I mean, Johnson's a latecomer to the to the party on civil rights. Um, but once he got there, uh, he was. Nobody you know, holds a candle to Lyndon Johnson when it comes to getting legislation through the United States Congress. Uh, and in the end, that's uh, there's. I think you're absolutely right that he deserves the lion's share of the credit for that phase of that part of that movement. Um, and you know, because there are all there's a, there's a legal phase, there's a commercial, there's an activism phase, those parts. Um, th these are all happening concurrently. But in terms of federal government action, particularly congressional action, it is clearly Johnson who delivers the big victories. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so I'm curious if you can tell us more about what you think is really motivating Eisenhower and his views on civil rights. So, you know, last night you were talking about um, how he is to some degree resistant to federal government overreach and intervention and that sort of colors his views. And then we have a quote, this very vulgar quote, which you read and which some of us have heard before, that reflects the, the fact that there's other issues at play. And in 1954, the average age for women to get married is 19. The average age for men to get married is 21. Uh -huh. And so chances are people marry their, or meet their spouses in high school. And this is what gets people out on the street protesting when it comes to desegregation in schools. It's guess who's coming to dinner. Oh, stuff, yeah, right? Right, right, yeah. So can you tell me what seems to you to be kind of the internal driving force for Eisenhower in terms of his thinking on race, right? Is it more about structural things about government and proper you know, roles of what should happen in terms of civil rights, or is it about more visceral views about race? In well, first of all, let me say that marriage statistic is really uh, interesting, um, and I have never thought of that. So, thank you. Uh, that, I do think that's an interesting, that's a really thoughtful way of getting at the, the deep feelings uh, that people have about school segregation. Um, you know, here's the hard thing about this: is that Eisenhower leaves a kind of messy legacy in this regard. I mean, there are times when he seems so ennobling, um, and he does the right thing. Will Rock, maybe the preeminent example of that. It's also important to note that things like he did desegregate military institutions, Washington, D.C., things that were under his more direct control as president. He favored segregation and pursued them. My friend Dave Nichols, who I mentioned before, a historian has written several books on Eisenhower and uh, Eisenhower presidency, really believes that those are the fullest expression of Eisenhower on race, um, and that, that Brown, in Dave's view, more offends 
I sense of institutionalism that it's the, the court really is trying to change, push something too fast in his view. Not something wrong, but something that, that Americans' hearts need to change before their laws can. Is sort of the way he would put it. I don't know that I would totally buy that, and the, the remark that I just read and uh, some other aspects of ICE legacy make you uh, sort of flinch at, uh, at his racial views. Um, I mean, it's, it's impossible for me to imagine Eisenhower being comfortable with interracial marriage. Uh, I mean, that's not, he is of a particular time and place, as I mentioned last night, and as you well know, uh, he grew up in, a, in segregated Abilene, he, he grew up in a segregated military. Segregation was part of his life, uh, and I think he accepted that without a lot of critical thinking through most of his life. Uh, for most of his life, it didn't really matter, really, in his view, because he was in the military, and he was taking orders, and he wasn't really a policymaker. Um, but whether that is actually a core conviction, or just a habit, or a, a sort of life that he was used to, that's hard to tell. Um, and he sends out, he leaves a very uh, complicated set of you know, sort of historical markers uh, in that regard. Um, it's, you know, Dave and I argue about this a little bit. I have argued about it a long time ago. We used to argue about this a lot. Um, and I, Dave's belief, and he spent a lot of time looking at this too, is that Eisenhower fundamentally had good-hearted, fairly progressive views on race and was uh, concerned about the right way to put those into effect without pushing people faster than they were willing to go. I'm a little more skeptical of that. Um, what I, where I would, and I, I see, and I can particularly, and Recollections of Warren and a few others, some elements of a, a more, more vulgar racism. Um, what where we do agree um, is that in the end, the like, legacy and record is pretty strong on race. Um, and whether that's because Herb Brownell and Earl Warren and William Brennan, all of whom were in their jobs because Warren put them there, because Eisenhower put them there, did them their jobs exceptionally well, or because they actually carried out a vision for Eisenhower. That's the part that's hard to know, for sure. Uh, Brownell, in his memoirs, is very generous to Eisenhower on race. Warren, in his memoirs, is very not generous to him on race. It is also true that Brownell worked much more closely with Eisenhower than Warren did. Now, Eisenhower and Warren really didn't talk much once Warren went to the court. So Warren's offense is partly Eisenhower's lack of support for the court. It's really not his offense so much at Eisenhower's view on race. Um, so I wish I had a more convincing answer to that. I think it's, uh, it's hard to know what was really in his heart on that question. Um, he ended up doing, in my view, compiling a better record than his instincts might otherwise have suggested that he was capable of. Um, in his view, it's more a more genuine expression of a, a more progressive set of views. Okay, we have a couple more minutes. We're gonna have a couple more questions. Yes. What was his uh, uh, view of uh, gay rights as far as the military? I've, I've heard a story that he was, uh, uh, well, approached when he was when he was in, in service and said, we need to make sure all the gay people go, and that uh, some people on his staff said, well, that would be me. And he changed Sorry. his mind, so I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, there, I, first of all, I, I would be shocked if he had a developed view, I, generally speaking, on gays in the military and just because it was at that point such an amazing issue, uh, there are a there are a few moments where there are members of his staff. At one, uh, well, there's a couple of moments historically, one with Johnson, one with Eisenhower, where members of the staff who were gay were outed. Um, and in the Eisenhower years, that generally occurred around the, in the national security environment. There's accusations um, that his uh, appointee, his nominee for ambassador of the Soviet Union was gay and Eisenhower, if I think it turns out not to be true, but there were allegations and Eisenhower stuck with him despite that. I, I, I mean, I, Eisenhower is not a leader on gay rights. Uh, don't get me wrong, I don't think there's any reason to think that. Uh, I'm not aware of him being particularly hostile uh, to gays in the military or in any other uh, forum. But again, I think that would have been such a, a remote a glimmer of an issue in the 1950s that it, I'd be surprised if he has much of a developer. What's a, I see your shirt. What is Nebraska in sex education? Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> a little, little controversy in the state. Is that right? No, I, I love controversy. I'm just asking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a journalist, and I live for it. Uh, well, God, I'm sure you're right. <laughs> One last question. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, well, join me in thanking you.